Evening all. There was a small panic there because <laughs> there, was a, there was a bit of a, a button clicking uh, mouse thing frenzy because it was all going a bit wrong for me there. Uh, quite a few of you in already. Good to see you. I'll get, let's just, uh, as we do know, I've got a guest in the night. I should say, welcome back to Jim's Monday Malt Samples. This is actually going to be the first of two in October. I don't know whether that makes you lucky or unlucky. Uh, because just the way my Monday nights will be working out, I will actually be able to do two this month. So there'll be one tonight and one later in the month with another guest, hopefully. Uh, so, Graham Horner in early doors. Graham, good to see you, buddy. All the way from down the road. Lee J. Brown, good to see you, my friend, as always. Multi Mission Menno is here. Whiskey Street Al, Al, good to see you. Drums and Draws, Tony. Tony will we'll give you a, a chat later on. McCallum, fine and rare. The Doc, always great to see you in. Let's see, where are we going? Pete Head, Frank, good to see you, my friend. Same old face as Radek. <laughs> uh, Radek's in. Neil Laverty, no man from up the road. Uh, let's see. Oh, man, there's a crowd in the night. Greg's Whiskey Guide, good to see you, Greg. Greg's got a vested interest in what we're going to be talking about tonight, I believe. Luna Aaron, Luna, always good to see you in here. Che Francis, welcome from Scotland. Des, Cressamere's in, Malt Review, because Malt, well, Jason probably wants to just see what's going on. So uh, let's, shall we, introduce tonight's guest. You've seen him here before. Uh, and before, just before we bring him in, I didn't say it, uh, so I just, <laughs> just so he knows. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can see the love that we have for each other on the you know. Um, I, I mean, to get abuse like that from a man that wears dresses, uh, you know, I don't know. Phil, these welcome. Haggis, these haggis monsters. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, my friend. Uh, cheers. Phil, you are drinking? I am drinking Jameson Black Barrel. Just Jameson to... Black Barrel. And I am on Tullamore G14, just in case anybody asked. Uh, we have uh, Whiskey Wim Stewart in. Probably it's really annoying Stuart to be here because he doesn't like to talk about Irish. And, uh, <laughs> and Mark Slinger is the latest to join, but I'm sure there'll be more in. So, Phil, what have you been up to? Stage uh, much the same as uh, everybody else. Um, it's kind of been Groundhog Day, where every day sigs into the, the next one. Uh, <laughs> is this a cooking show? No. <laughs> um, yeah, so just been uh, been trying to get a wee bit more writing done, actually. Um, I kind of went off the boil a wee bit with that. Um, but I'm kind of focusing at the minute with malt, with... Uh, Trying to do a few interviews with around the, the down distilleries, so hopefully mm -hmm. I'm going to get a chat with uh, with Charlotte about Eclanville. Um, Eclanville, there's no yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I was chatting to uh, William Stafford about doing sort of a piece on Copeland at some point as well, if we can. Um, I was hoping to head up actually to Sleeve Lake to interview James. Doherty up there, um, mm -hmm. everything that's going on there, but uh, just with obviously the, the whole COVID thing, that's like just a total no no at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, so that may end up being a fun interview, sadly, rather than getting to, to see what's going on, mainly because I was hoping to see if I could snaffle a bit of their uh new mic and have a look at the first yeah. cast, down, you know. Uh, Hinch as well, I'll try and get on board, um, but. Jamie and Dad sort of put me on the back burner until the actual distillery is on the go. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, so other than that, man, it's just been uh, consuming. Be good. Well, the thing uh, is, it'd be good to actually get an insight into a lot of these new, especially well, northern or closer to Northern Ireland distilleries, you know. Well, well that's it. I mean, to be, to be fair, man, like, you know, nobody's really given... 
like David down in Radham, and no one was giving David or the guys at Eklundville or anything. They didn't really have much airtime, you know. Yeah. Um, there definitely seems to be more made about some of the distilleries down south that are, you know, coming online. Um, so not the, not just because I'm based in Northern Ireland but, or no. Northern Irish, I just kind of thought, well, you know what, these guys are all going to be handy. I'm excited actually about what's going on, especially in County Down. I just think like that's uh, all of a sudden has become like the hotspot of distillation in, in, mm-hmm. in Ireland. You know, we have, uh, especially if like the, the Crumlin um, rope distillery gets to go ahead as well. I mean, you're going to have five or six distilleries down there within really yeah. short uh, uh, distance of each other. Um, yeah. So they're going to have like a, a guaranteed whiskey trail. <laughs> so, you know, it's going to be, That's you know, um, also, yeah, thought, had... sorry, go ahead. Interesting there recently as well that um, Bush Mills have got a grain distillery. Oh, granted. So, so there you, yeah. heard it, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, it's been, the, the, the plan has been approved. So, there's going to be a, right. a, a grain distillery put into Bush Mills as well. So, I've sort of been trying to. Yeah, well, I've been trying to read, read between the lines on that. I was kind of thinking, is, is this a Brexit thing or is this more just a thing of they're just severing all their ties with IDL? Um, yeah. You know? Yeah, that, that could be too. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, Bushmills is such a, an international thing. Like, Yeah. And I, I am, you know, and, and the, the whiskey drinking world, not this community, the whiskey drinking world doesn't know that the Bush Mills is partially from another distillery. <laughs> you know, yeah. It, well, it's, yeah, the blends, yeah, yeah, the, the blends. Yep. You know, and, and it's one of those things that that uh, I certainly, as I still consider, I I know sometimes people think I've got the knives out for Bush Mills. My opinions have changed slightly recently, uh, but uh, I certainly would love to see everything done there and have everything. Well, it's not going to be completely in house, obviously, but you know. Yeah. I, well, I, mean, I did not know that. Yeah. Well, I think for me, that's the thing that, you know, then you will actually be able to turn around and say, you know, everything that is actually Bush Mills now. Um, yeah. Well, Greg, so the, the they have a supply agreement with, with Middleton. Yeah. So they actually get the grain for Bush Mills, the blends from Middleton. Um, what I believe actually for proper valve is that the grain actually comes from Great Northern. I well, I've there's heard, a good chance. I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm scared to bring proper twelve up. I thought you just <laughs> name dropped it every night. <laughs> well, <laughs> just just to keep the money coming. Oh, <laughs> well, well, I mean, like I'm always in the market for more toilet. <laughs> Sorry, Donner Pass Whiskies and hello, Tim and uh, Richard and News in from Canada. Uh, sorry, uh, but I, that's the other one that I'd actually be very, very pleased to hear more about is Eklundville for the simple fact that there's there's surely a future for Eklundville outside of Dunville's and Gin. Oh, massively. I mean, yeah. like, um, to be honest, the thing about Eklundville, which, like, we're going to talk about, you know, the tourists tonight, you know, mm-hmm. Waterford here. But actually, I think of all the distilleries in Ireland, Eklundville has the greatest claim to it because all their barley comes from the Arts Peninsula. It's mainly grown by Shane himself. Mm-hmm. So these guys are actually going to be a field to glass distillery. They're they're not going to be buying in malt mm-hmm. from anywhere else or anything like that. It's all going to be their own and their mm-hmm. their neighbours type of thing, you know. It's just uh, that they're doing it. The, they're doing it the old-fashioned way, as in they're building themselves up now. From the, it's it's getting the funds going, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Um, although saying that, actually, like I mean, Clona Kilty are kind of going down that route as well. Actually, where I noticed that you know they're pretty much using barley just from that specific region of mm-hmm. West Cork. Um, now obviously, if they become successful, it'll be interesting to see whether they keep that up. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but no, I think like the the plans for Exxonville, I think are, are fantastic. It's um, and you know they're they're not really bigging themselves up. That's kind of what I like about it as well. They're just yeah. kind of 
quietly plodding away and you know we thought maybe this year for belfast whiskey week that they might launch their first malt mm -hmm. um but i mean they're like seven years and they have seven year old spirit now mm -hmm. so uh, i kind of think they're probably hanging off to the 10 year old because I, I, I think they need to come out of the the shadows of Dunville's. I, I really do. It's it's a nice story, but that to me, that's all it is. And it's sort of, it's, well, the other thing is, sorry, it's not all it is. It's the opportunity to charge an awful lot of money for uh, somebody else's whiskey every now and again sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's part of the, it's part of the big problem for some of the, the Irish guys. I mean, I have a certain amount of sympathy with the guys at Dunville's um, I mean, their the older whiskies won't really ever be cheap, mm -hmm. mainly because they have such difficulty sourcing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, much in the same way that Brendan has the same problem in Cologne. I mean, like one of the things actually, I sort of tipped my cap to Eklundville was that like for uh, the Bonded Experimental Series, I mean, it was actually them that sold, it was Eklundville that sold Bushmill Spirit to uh, right. Brendan to help him out right. with the blend. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, Brendan's thing is that he maybe only wants to buy one or two casks and, yeah. you know, go to Bush Mills and they want you to buy half a million litres. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, 100%. You know? 100%. Oh, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? You know, that, and yet again, this is the communication that they have with each other. Uh, sorry, Whiskey Pilgrim, Frederickson and Eric Waitson. Good evening, guys. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good to have especially these newer, younger distilleries, to have that great communication. And I didn't realise that. that, that yeah, that camaraderie had. as well. It's like good camaraderie. Yeah. I mean, they're looking out for each other, which is good. Yeah. Um, and yet yeah. again, sorry, you and I were having this chat in the green room prior to going on about banter, Irish mm -hmm. banter, and being able to, because I've watched Jared, or Jared, uh, Jarleth and, uh, and Brendan, Go at each. Other. I've watched them in, oh, in, I, yeah. in the same chats, like, and they're just tearing each other apart. And it's you know all in the name of fun, and it's just yeah. excellent. Well, that's it exactly. They're they're great fellows, I have to say. Um, Brandon especially, is like he's a absolute dynamite. So he's, he's a character. He is he's a, a character. character. Um, and I think as he's uh, as his piece in Malt Review kind of showed, you know, he's not he's not one for sure going to challenge our Brandon. Mm -hmm. You know. Yet again, I was I, like yourself. I was a bit gutted because I was supposed to go down to Cologne, and uh, same story. Everything just Brendan and I had chatted it out, and I would get down for each just to, just for a chat with him more than yeah. anything else. And uh, and this all fell through because of because of everybody's problem currently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it exactly. Richard Agnew, Irish banter. I'll I'll fetch the two of you a slab. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Richard, Richard's from, I can't remember where Richard, he told me where he's from originally, but he's in Canada now, right, so, okay. uh, but, it, but he does like the banter, <laughs> I think it it, it, uh, it brings him home. Yes. He, 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 you know, he, <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the terms he uses sometimes that I forget, <laughs> you know, and uh, it brings it back to me then even, who right. still lives here. <laughs> so anyway, right, uh, Waterford. Yeah. Uh, it was on, as I say, it was on, as I said in the description for this video, no matter, always from Dungannon. There you are, I was from Dungannon originally. Uh, yeah, Dungannon. <laughs> whether, uh, whether Waterford was going to make a difference to our lives or not, it was certainly on the tip of all of our tongues at one point earlier this year. Everybody, to me, as far as I could tell, was talking about it because they were, it was, well, it was that word, terroir, wasn't it? Yeah, well, that's it. And it's um, obviously the, they were doing their first release, the pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the ethos behind Waterford um, had got a lot of people excited because, I mean, it is a total nerd fest, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and obviously, you know, Mr. Rene has his 
fans and he has his detractors and uh, well, well he did he did upset a few people there's somebody yeah. in here tonight and i'm not going to, i'll not name his name i'll not i'll not i'll not call him out but i'll just say that it rhymes with tags risky tide uh, <laughs> and <laughs> And Teg got slightly upset by, by Mark Mania. And I mean, I think it was, and, and you, you said it yourself there, that uh, that Mark has a, a bit of a, a a strange way about him. Doesn't, yeah, let, I mean, doesn't always come across the best, put it like that. No, I mean, he can sometimes be a tad aggressive on social media and stuff like that. And um do you know, like, I mean, the guy has his views, he has his views, like, and whatever. I don't really get too upset about any of that sort of stuff. Um, As cool. you said, he, he was the same person where he was prior to that and prior to that, and, you know, so... Absolutely. I mean, for Gladdy, he, he was a nutcase too. So, <laughs> you know, um, so, yeah, fair play to him. At the end of the day, you know, whenever you're building a brand, I suppose, like, you know, you're, you do anything you can, really, to, uh, to get interest. Well, um, I've, I, I've said it prior to this that there was a bit of debate come up about the about the branding and mm. and the whole build up behind it, etc. Now I must say, I said to you already, I love the ball. I, th I think the ball's stunning. Yeah. It looks like no other bottle of whiskey out there. Yeah, it's uh, to me they put their money where their mouth was, where yeah. that was concerned. Yeah. Uh, so then the next question to come up was, well, is the juice itself any good? And and yet again, they they did the right thing. Now, the first one I think we're looking at here is, and I'll actually call this up because this was the Valley Kilcavan. Yep. One. Now, that number on the back, the reason why I've put that up, I did, I actually dropped a link. If anybody's interested, I know Lunaran has some Waterford, and uh, I'm sure there's others out there who have it. That if they wish to look into their, I'm sure they know this already. But on the back of the box, they'll have this, and and this is basically, and and to me, as I said to you earlier, this is what we've all been looking for this is what we've actually been asking for all along was give us the information yeah. and waterford have done it and i don't this is your box not mine and yeah. i just so i actually went in very very quickly and uh discovered that that, that the grower of that barley was david walsh chemist and uh, it was harvested on the 17th of August, 2015, distilled week eight of 2016 and bottled in June, 2020. Yep. Okay. Now, the one thing actually that I have yet to find, and I was actually surprised at, was the maturation, as in what wood are they using for? Well, if you fire that code in onto the Waterford website and the end of the terroir thing, so... Mm -hmm. You will you will get that if you keep on scrolling down the bottom. Once you get once you get past um, like mental things like what does the farm sound like? Ah, maybe right. I just maybe I just get bored. <laughs> you, you maybe you maybe did right. So you can uh, you can you can listen you can listen to the wind blowing through the barn, which is you know, yeah, which is quality. You, you found out like when the barley was sown, harvested, when it arrived at the cathedral, when it went for malting, when it arrived at the distillery, fermentation, and all the rest of it. You find out who the distillers were. So we had James Ellickson, Patrick Parr, Ian O'Brien, uh, and Cian Duran for that mm -hmm. one. Then you also get like a wee map of like the field where it was actually uh, the barley was harvested. You get to find out about the, the soil type. So if you okay. love your fine loamy drift, then uh, you'll be delighted about that. So then you find out about the barley, the yeast, and the water. So this was uh, Taberna uh, barley. Um, they used Murray distillers yeast. It was the fermentation time was one hundred and fifty point five hours. Right. So about three times as long as Bush Mills type of ferment theirs. Um, and then it gives you a full breakdown of all the casks that go into it. 
Oh. Um, so the first full barrels came from Kelvin Cooperage. Um, the Vim du Natural, which is kind of like the sweet fortified wines. Um, now that came from, um, my French pronunciation is terrible. Um, but it's from three or four. Three or four different um, cooperages. So there was, uh, I'm not even going to pronounce it now, actually. I'm going to look <laughs> <completely> wrong. Um, <clears throat> now, the thing about this one was the Vim de Naturel, there was no specific as to whether whether it was like sherry, whether it was like port or what it was. Um, and then there was premium French oak cask as well. So basically, the breakdown on that is. You had 45% first fill bourbon, 37% French oak, and 18% Vin de Natural. Uh -huh. um, there's no virgin oak in this. Because whenever they started out, they were whenever they had to still, they fill 50% um, first fill bourbon, 20% uh, virgin oak, generally. Uh -huh. 25 or 15% French and then um or was it 30 no sorry I think it was 30% virgin and then 15% French oak and 15% Vin de Natural I think that was the way they set it out so this one's kind of a wee bit different from what they were planning to use because there was no virgin oak but it wasn't available at the time whenever they were putting the single farm origin together mm -hmm. um and I think actually then whenever you come on to the next one you'll be able to see a bit of a difference I'll get there in a moment. Sorry, the, the one thing just, I sorry, Richard Agnew was asking, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I take it, Richard, you mean here, as in this province? Um, it's, <laughs> I was, Phil and I were talking about this earlier, and I still actually seen, it's the 1.2s now you're talking, the one point, most of the 1.1s are all gone. Uh, but uh, Aberdeen Whiskey Shop had them at a, a at a fairly good what i think is a fairly good price but it was the, it was the rrp it was basically around that 75 76 pounds mark which yep. to me is actually well i'm saying it's a good price i haven't actually tried it yet but I'll, <laughs> I'm, I'm just about to do that uh on the i must say on the nose it it has a, a feel of quality now i'm not actually just bringing this up i'm not saying it because for the sake of saying it it just does smell like as if it's got a bit of quality about it. Yet again, for something that's young. I mean, this one here is just shy of four years old. Mm -hmm. um, now, to me, I think it's definitely very spirit forward. Like it's, you know. Spirit forward, but creamy at the same yeah, time. Yeah, it's malty. Yeah. Um, like I get a bit of pine resin and like lemon rind off it as well. Pain definitely. Um, now, one of the things I was I was noticing this last night, and uh, after I left it in the glass for about ten minutes, I started getting a bit of like struck match. Uh, it's sort of like a sulfur thing. Just a maybe less sulfur, but you know, whenever like yeah. you just don't match out. Yeah. Um. So. It, it, actually it's weird when you when you acclimate yourself to it there is it, it is actually very spirit forward initially yeah but you i don't even think it's a case of it calming down as you just get used to it and then you start to find the other stuff in behind it yeah so um like i, I mean it, personally at the start i think as you say like your nose will first of all get like Definitely the spirit and the malt. Yep. I think once you give it a bit of time, then you start getting a bit of like apple and peach. Apple, yes. Um, Agree there. I actually got like a strawberry custard last night off this, where it was kind of like that, like a cut strawberry, but you know, and that creaminess that you get from custard. Strawberry custard, you say? Yeah. Are you what? Yeah, yeah, you do like your food. <laughs> um, do you know in lockdown, what else are you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, as I say, it just feels very. I've said it before. It feels accomplished. You know, it feels like as if there's been a bit of work there. That it's not just. But then that being said, to me, more what about 
more what I'm looking for tonight, or more of what I'm is the difference between this one, yeah, and the other one. Now, that's something I'll need to we'll go into at the time, but is there a maturation difference between these farms? Yeah, there is, right? Yeah. So, you should, so it's not just a barley difference, it's <clears throat> no. not. It's not all just about the terroir, really. It's not about the... the... Well, see, this is one of the issues uh, that I have at the minute with Waterford and where I think they have lost an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So whenever I went down there, um, I mean, I've been down twice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like a class experience, full stop. Like to go and chat with Ned, who's the head distiller, to chat with Neil, who's the head brewer. Mm -hmm. They're both so passionate about like what they do. Um, like whenever you walk into Waterford, there's like this wall where they have like in five or six pictures, like illustrated the whole process of cultivation to the cathedral to the malting. On through making the beer, distillation, blah, blah, blah. Um, both times I've been there, I think I spent an hour and a half just at that, just walking in the door. Yeah. Right. And just talking about the varieties of barley they're, cult they're cultivating, just the whole ethos behind what they want to do here. Um, and then whenever I went like, to the stills, um, they actually had. Um, it was Olympus barley, but it was three different types uh, mm -hmm. in that they were conventionally grown, organic, and biodynamic. And they all tasted different. Right. And then you got into like the new make room mm -hmm. and where Ned makes his wee blends and things like that as well. Yeah. Um, so for me, like whenever I was there, like the once you've been there, the terroir debate for me was like knocked on the head because it was like, well, yes, they all, all these, even though it could be the same barley, but it's come from a different farm. And mm. they've essentially went through exactly the same process. As everybody, as everybody else does. Because it's all computer automated. Yeah. Um, they were all different. Mm -hmm. And like the one that really got me was like, Ned was like, right, this is my favorite, like new make. Can you tell me what you get off it? Um, so I was like nosing it and tasting it. I was like, well, I'm getting like loads of strawberry off this, but on the on the finish, it's quite salty. Mm -hmm. And Ned started laughing. He goes, well, this guy owns a strawberry farm. <laughs> so there's like a strawberry farm beside where the barley's grown, mm -hmm. and it's and it's right on the edge of the coast, like it's right beside the sea. Yeah. So it had its effect. So it had its effect. And like I mean, to me, I was just like, right, well, that's that's kind of like clenched that, you know? Yep. But where I think they have made the mistake is when they brought out the single farm origin, I thought it would have been a good idea if they had had say like five CL of New Make mm -hmm. to go along with the bottle. So that you could see whether did the terroir survive the maturation. Yep. Yep. And although you're going to see differences between the single farm origins, personally, I'm more interested to see has the terroir of that single farm origin survived being stuck in virgin oak and being stuck in first full bourbon and, you know, that to me was the interesting point and i think that's where they could really have nailed things down and went well look here like it's kind of it's plain to be seen well as i you said know? that you know at the end of the day if the maturation is different from one to another your terroir doesn't necessarily matter anymore does it you know and that, that you know they've, they've changed the maturation so as you said 100 percent, put some new make in there to let people discover what that what the terroir yeah. has done to the whiskey. Yeah. I actually, I'm a firm believer that, and and uh, I've chatted about this in the past. Uh, 
And I'm a firm believer that every distillery should put out a 20CL bottle of new make spirit that they make yeah. just to give people an opportunity to see what it's like before maturation. Now, Absolutely. some of it's awful. You and I know that it's awful, you know, and it takes that calming down. It takes that influence of the cask to actually uh, to fix it. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and I mean, and, and actually, <laughs> I, I chatted about this recently, and you, you maybe disagree with me here, actually, but Bush Mills, I think it's a very rough spirit, and uh, and and the chat was that uh, what, what I had actually I'd come up with a small theory, which is probably very wrong, was that uh, the reason why they bought an awful lot of stuff at forty percent is it takes it to get down to forty percent before it starts to calm down and taste like anything, you know. And, and it's yeah. Well, I think actually, you know, you you may be onto something there because personally, I think that well, but, but, but I guess I mean. I, I, if, I know people who work in the place and, you know, they tell me that it's just battered out. You know, it's battered out as quick as they can get it out there. I mean, at the end of the day, like, that is one of the things with Waterford. Like, you know, you're sitting here with a a spirit that's had a 150-hour fermentation. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, that's, like, going on a week. Yeah. You have Bush Mills do, like, two days. Yeah. Just over, maybe just over two days. Um. So for them, I mean, it's about it's about yield. It's not yeah. really about creating flavors at the minute. Mm -hmm. Now, back in the days, whenever Frank McHardy was there, and he was experimenting with double distillation and things like that, I think that would be a, a very different ethos that was going on mm -hmm. in Bushmills at the time. Which is whenever you taste whiskey from Bushmills from the eighties and nineties, it's so superior to what you're going to get in a bottle mm -hmm. now. <laughs> And and you know I will argue that point with anybody, um, but you know and, that, and that's the thing is um, at least with Waterford setting out they're they're not out there just to go directly for yield they're trying to get flavors actually in the new making yeah and it's because it, this is the thing I'm actually sitting here nose and nose and nose at this and it's. To coin that phrase from Ralphie yet again, it's an integrity bottling to, yeah. to an extent. There's no age statement on it, but we do know what age it is because yep. we don't have to look too hard, you know. And it's well, well uh, the, the, the funny thing is, there, Jim, as you see, that they actually had to remove information off the back label. Mm -hmm. They were actually, they were actually basically done for putting too much information on the label, right? <laughs> so, so. They've actually had to pare down what is on on the label, but at the end of the day, like they, like, I mean, the level of detail that goes into this stuff is just mm -hmm. insane. Like the bit that got me was whenever you go into the distillery as well, like every distillation has a passport. So, mm -hmm. in the same way that like you have a beef farmer. And before he sells that to the EU, it has a passport where it tells you like where this animal was reared and what it was reared on and like whether it's had antibiotics or whatever it is, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. All that is there, you know, down to yeah. like, even at the front of the passport, they will tell you like the family history. They will tell you about the person who's grown the barley, you know, like that's just total yeah, word fill and it's like enough. so over and above even probably the, the information that us geeks really want you yeah know? um but it's all there someone um, had asked the question earlier on what's the head distiller shoe size uh <laughs> you know, probably, quite happy. I probably <laughs> would tell you what i imagine but it, it's just i have to say now it definitely just on the nose quality Mm. Oh yes. Yep. Biscuity, mouth watering. That's incredibly biscuity, isn't it? Well, again, yeah. again, I think that the thing is though that just shows you that. I mean, it's just shy of four years old. So I mean, it's going to be spirit forward. I mean, I get a lot of like. As you were saying, like a uh, biscuit, yeah, I'm getting like honey malt sweetness. It's just like this surge of honey malt. Well, it's, actually, it's like an oatmeal biscuit to me. Yeah. Um, now, interestingly, after you get that surge of 
for me, once you get that surge of like sweetness, then you start getting like this black pepper kind of heat. Er earthiness and heat, yep. Um, and then for me, it kind of went a, bit, a wee bit of vegetal, like there's a wee bit of tartness, but a citrus pith. Like I was getting a wee bit of grapefruit. What I'm actually going to say is, and, I, and I, well, actually the first thing to me that sums this up, it's not like any other Irish whiskey I've ever had. Mm. It does not taste like what we know as Irish whiskey. No. I'm not saying it tastes like scotch, because it's weird that I couldn't think of a, off the top of my head, I couldn't actually think of a, a pigeonhole where I would put it in the scotch either. Yeah. Because it's it's got elements of both going on there almost. Yeah. Weirdly though, what I found was that once I got past the whole like, like to me it kind of goes in waves. It goes like this way where you go sweet, slightly vegetable, vegetal, a bit bitter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hot, and then mm -hmm. another set it comes out onto like this caramel note. And, yep. And a bit more vanilla all of a sudden comes out. And, well, actually, I was getting the vanilla even closer to the start. Right. And, and now, yes, 100%. You're right. Actually, there's an awful lot of vanilla in the finish for me. Yeah. I mean, I think even if you look at the legs in the glass, I mean, they're pretty much at 50%. I mean, it's, it's definitely oily. And it's this was the other thing that I was thinking, I was actually going to say to you, that that RRP that it's generally sitting at 75 76 pounds if you can get it yes, yes it's young okay it's young but certainly it, it falls within that bracket i would say uh, to me they're will say that i mean i don't think they're overcharging for it well i think i think for me like i mean i always knew that like whenever you see the level of detail that was going in like, who else is going cultivating barley on a farm-by-farm -farm basis, mm -hmm. rejecting barley that doesn't meet their standards? So, you know, even this year, it hasn't been a great harvest. I mean, That's they're quite right, open. Yeah. They're quite hard, uh, open to the fact that, you know, they may end up actually instead of having 40 uh, farms this year, they might only end up taking barley from 16, say, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, I mean, they do a grower's table. <laughs> yeah. So, which promotes a wee bit of healthy competition between the farmers as well, you know? Um, yeah, so you go, and, you go and store that, you malt it individually, you distill it individually. Like, no one's going to that length. So no. know that like this stuff isn't necessarily going to be cheap. No. Um, Agreed. Sorry, I just I, had a comment from Lenar in there. That I'll put it up, carry on, and you can. Yeah. Yeah, it tastes like, yep, I would agree with Lenar on that, yeah. Totally there. Yep, yeah, they're 100%. That there's not, you know, there isn't another distillery out there doing what they're doing. No. Um, JJ saying there that Daft Mill grows good barley. Mm -hmm. Oh, that man, he's just obsessed with that Daft Mill nonsense. Um, right, before we go any further, yeah. I want to get into it because we also have, if you bear with me, uh, there is another one. It's just going to take me a minute to find it, it's been up here for ages. Uh, oh, that's this one, isn't it? Yeah, that's the other one. Okay, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and it is grown by Ed Harper on Bano Island, harvested September 2015, distilled week 25 of 2016, bottled June 2020. Yep. Yeah. So, the interesting, so thing about those, the interesting thing about those numbers is so. Um, the first one was F002, so it was actually the second farm that they distilled. So this is now the 14th farm that they've mm -hmm. distilled. Ah, so that's where they come from then. I yeah. wasn't even sure about those numbers, whether it was a yeah. ra randomly generated thing or... Uh, no. 
So this one is actually about four months younger. And it's totally, totally different. Yeah. I mean, I think even if you uh, if you look at the colour. You know, I like, noticed that one's an awful lot. I think the first one's an awful lot paler. Yeah. There's a, oh, there's a big difference in colour. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect, as I was saying earlier on, that, that is because the Bano has... 20% virgin oak casks. Right. Um, and there's a wee bit more VDN. So in this particular case, they've used all also as the VDN. Right. So it's 20% 20, 20 VDN, 25% French oak. I have to be bluntly honest. And the one thing that has ruined this for me, one thing that has soured the milk a little, yep. is the fact I didn't realize that about the difference. And it never even dawned on me before to ask the question about the maturation. Yep. Is the maturation the same from one to the other? Because to me, yep. you know, what what is the point in, in really, really, really going on about, about terroir if you're going to put out two different whiskies anyway? And then, you know, that's sort of, you know what I'm saying? That they're, they're sort yep. of playing in the same park, but at the end of the day, they're, they're totally different. Well, I think, like, the one thing that I will say about the whole terroir thing, I think a lot of people have got, their knickers and a twist a wee bit too much over it, right? But the wrong end of the stick almost. Yeah, because I mean if you actually read some of the blogs that Mark has done on the Waterford website, you know basically he's saying that every component, every every part of what you're doing is important. Mm -hmm. So all he was really saying was, well look, if you go to a vineyard Right. Yeah, terroir is the big word. Well, it is. To, it is, but the grape is king. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, that is that is the thing. The, the grape is king, and so uh, I can understand where he's coming from. Where he's like, you know, barley is one of the most flavorful and complicated grains there is out there, which is obviously the reason why it's been used in making whiskey. Why not celebrate it? Why, why make it this homogenous product whenever actually it's definitely not? Once you start going back to the new makes, it's definitely not. Very true. Very <clears> true. <throat> I, I actually had that very conversation with, um, oh, his name escapes me. They had the stiller and hench. Oh, Aaron. Aaron. And yeah. him and I had that conversation, you know, and I, I, I says everybody seems to, to put an awful lot of on us. And Greg actually, Greg's Whiskey Guide actually put a, or did a great video on this about the amount of onus that gets put on oak and wood and what yep. you know the amount of wood and all that's used and i i said that the iron i says i don't know i would tend to lean on you make first and see you know i want to know what's going on there yeah before well, the, thing about it, before it's been influenced. the thing about it is though that you know a lot of the like fresh orchard fruit flavors that you get in new mix it's not going to come from a barrel. It has to be there first. You know, so like you put it in a, in a sherry cask, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get the dark fruits. Yep. You know, which is something that you're probably inherently not going to get in a new make. <laughs> and you're going to get nutty um, flavors and spice and depending on, on whether it's American oak or whether it's European oak. And, you know, but at the end of the day, as we say in malt, I mean, if you make a crap spirit and you put it into crap casks, you're not going to get a good whiskey, yep. you know? And, and that's the thing where I sort of tip my cap a wee bit to, to Rene is, well, you know, you're, you're going, I'm not saying that nobody else is like trying to make, not make the best spirit they can make, but I mean, these guys are really going full throttle to make the best spirit that then that they can put into the best wood program that they have and try and deliver the best yeah. final product, you know. But you see, before you go, you see before anything else is said, and before it sounds like as if I've just taken what you said, I've already recorded a review for a Glendronic, <laughs> and I said pretty much what you just said. Yeah. If you if, if if you can put out a young whiskey, if you make a good spirit and make a good choice for your casks, and it doesn't matter about age, if the, if the, if if you make the right choices earlier on, 
you can still make a good whiskey. Yeah. You know, <clears> and it doesn't and, and put a young age statement on it. Yeah. Or or leave it off. But I personally would rather see what age it is, be it young or old. And yeah. and then and make own decisions. Yeah. So the differences are very, very apparent here. Yeah. As I say, that first one uh, was, you know, you can smell it in the nose straight away, it, it, even before you get into the palate. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot more wood spice going on in this one. I mean, I'm, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm getting sort of like Ryan spilt bread off it and um, mm -hmm. dried ginger. There's even a pot with like a beeswax or something on it for me. Yeah, get that too. Um, yeah, that nutmeg. ginger, yeah, ginger, nutmeg, spice. Yeah, as you say, it's it's all wood spice that one, not in a bad way. No, but although <clears throat> interestingly, like last night I was like spending quite a bit of time with this, so I was sort of letting them. I actually end up getting pink marshmallow. <laughs> Off Just the pink bottom. marshmallow. Pink, pink marshmallow, marshmallow now, not the yeah. white one. No, no, definitely. <laughs> um, just had that real it's sweet. A, maybe the powdery thing, like powdered sugar almost. Uh, yeah, it could be. Because uh, I, I can't say I'm actually getting pink marshmallow, but certainly there is a powder, like a powdered sugar thing there. See, I actually find that more spirit forward than the first one. Well, Hello. probably will be. To me, this one there's less fruit. There's less of the orchard fruit or anything coming through. On the second one. On the second one, yeah. Oh they're, yeah, they're, I would agree. Yeah, totally. Definitely, like, and this is where I said, like, you're going to definitely see that the virgin oak has made a difference. Yeah. Um, because you're definitely getting a lot more of that spicy character and wood mm. notes. Um. Uh, Luna Aaron said too much nutmeg, ginger tea. Yeah. Ginger tea, yes, I agree. Actually, even green tea as well. Mm. And putting it firmly back in the Irish whiskey category for me, <laughs> the second one, that, that Banno Island. Not, oh, that's there's even mint on that. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I think you're getting, uh, like, for me, that one there straight away is like a, like a, creme brulee sugar hit you know, you know the, the top of a creme brulee whenever you crack mm. it yes um, and it's but it's an awful awful lot of wood spice yeah i mean there's a lot more clove there's cinnamon nutmeg mm. i get a touch of licorice off it you get definitely oak tannin off it as well yep but it feels to me like there's a it's it, to me. It's actually getting closer to an Irish whiskey feel. Uh, the the newer or the actual tailing, what they're putting out now. That's not the older. The, what was came from Cooley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Has <clears throat> got more of that feel. Uh, I have a single barrel there, which is more that sort of brings an awful lot of that wood spice. And when you put it together with what's going on in here. It's starting to feel a bit more like it. Whereas just simply it doesn't mean anything, but just more the fact that the first one did not feel like an Irish any Irish whiskey I've ever tried before. Yeah. I'd say this one's starting to just sort of lend itself a wee bit. I think uh, do you know I think this one kind of in a way is reminiscent of a pot still because of all that clove and cinnamon and you know, I think uh, and that's great. Like quite dry yeah very nice very nice yet again prefer i must say i prefer the the bally kilcalvin Kil 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 just rolls off the tongue that it does uh, it's easy i mean, <laughs> I mean there's a lot more pepperiness in this definitely like no, it's, very um, much so. it's kind of mouth puckering but also kind of it's quite juicy though that's the thing i was like all oh, their mouths kind of like Pop run away, it's quite juicy, but 
I would actually, and if you don't, I tell you what I'm going to do, is actually add a little water to that second. The first one, uh, you know what, I'll just add a little water to both. Why not? It's free. Why? Well, this is it. Mm. Uh, sorry, Drew for me, easy. He was in, Drew, sorry, mate. I did see you earlier on, but just, uh, there was so much going on with chat about farmers and, and terroir and all that. I did say I would mention farmers at one point. <laughs> well, the thing is as well, like, I mean, I think they've just re recently released the first organic, Irish fully organic. Uh, Waterford did. Yeah, so I think right. it's Gaia that's called. Um, the biodynamic thing, I don't know whether they'll end up doing a, a single farm origin for the biodynamic, but I don't, do you know much about biodynamic? It's all very technical. Ah, it is. <laughs> um, no, like, so the biodynamic thing is essentially like organic on steroids and LSD. Right. Right. So there's a bit of an astrological and a bit of a spiritual thing going on with the whole biodynamic thing, you know? Do they so, ring, be ring bells at it, stuff like that? Well, well put, I guess I'll, I'll give you an illustration. So for like a couple of like the preparations that they use for the fields, right? So one of them, which is to prepare the, 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 the humus layer, like so the top layer of all the de decaying mm -hmm. detritus, right? So you get crushed powdered quartz and <laughs> you put that into a cow horn, which you bury in the spring. You remove it in the autumn, and then you spray that during the wet season as an antifungal, right? And then for making compost, one of the preparations is that you get oak bark and you stuff it in the skull of a domesticated animal, so whatever, like sheep, cow, whatever. Uh -huh. You surround that by peat in an area where you're getting rain runoff. And again, you do that spring to autumn, and then that supposedly gives you like super amazing <laughs> like compost. And then they also, to take it a step further again, is then that some of them use like a, the planting calendar is based on astrological or, or lunar cycles. Mm -hmm. so, so you'll base like, I'm going to plant on a full moon or whatever it is, or a crescent moon, and I'm going to harvest a, you know, blah, 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 I don't know why. Like, how many other distilleries are going to go to that hassle? <laughs> I, I, I'm not like, I, I, you know me. <laughs> I could clean live in person that I am, but it smells like horse shit to me. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's it's one of the like I mean to me that is taking it a little far because it's even there was something you said earlier on, and I mean it's not to diminish from this. Maybe we'd be proved wrong. I don't know, but uh, it, it even when because whenever you're talking about barley's and and what barley's can do. And the first one that came into my mind was Octomore. Yeah. And the Octomore from Brook Lally. And I just thought to myself, how much influence does that barley have when you add so much phen phenolic influence to it that, you know, it's a case of, does it really matter what the hell barley you're talking about anymore? That, you know. Yeah. So it just it just sprung to mind. So I just thought I'd put it out there. Yeah. But uh, sorry, getting back to it. This having added water, this uh, Ballycle Cavern just turned buttery um, uh, caramel, caramac, which is one that, that comes up with me that, that people yeah. don't know what it is. But lots of that and like kind of like um, it's yogurty as well. There's kind of like yeah, a... it's it's really really nice. I must say I do like that. That's that's right in my ballpark. That one. And I suppose like this is the thing is. Like... Hmm. You know, by, by releasing these single farm margins, um, you probably are going to have people all catered at different tastes, you know? Yeah. Now, personally, I'm slightly disappointed in Waterford. And I'll go into some of the reasons why. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody might hear. Uh, well, you know, like... <laughs> Yeah, at the end of the day, one of one of the the co-editors of, of of Malt works for the, works for them, and um, you know, like myself and JJ are going to be doing tasting notes in this in twenty twenty one. We purposely decided that 
we were going to leave it until 2021 to get away from the hype. Yeah. Let other people come out with it first. I mean, um, to a certain extent, Mark's affiliation with Waterford has led to fingers being pointed that, you know, we were going to be uh, just, you know, let's put them on a pedestal and say how wonderful everything is. Yeah. Now, the thing for me whenever I first went to Waterford was I was told that they weren't going to release anything until at least five years. Mm-hmm. Right. And when I asked the question about will you do like single farm releases, I was told probably not unless they're exceptional. Like these things are going to be half. I mean, there's going to be have to be like some casks that are just so exceptional. We cannot do anything other than put them out as single farms, right? Mm-hmm. But the whole idea was we are going to be doing cuvées, right? So we're going to take the best of what we have, and we're going to make a cuvée. We're going to make this vatting, this blend of. And, you know, from what they were saying was, you know, if there are certain farms that just didn't cut it, they wouldn't get used, right? Yeah. So I was sort of like, right, okay. And, like, I, I've, I've tasted stuff in their, like, tasting room that was, like, 18 months old, 24 months old. That honestly, I would have been quite happy to have paid £100 a bottle for there and then. It was so good. Mm-hmm. And to be quite frank, these two do not match up to that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, like, fair enough. I can sort of see, like, for me, I think personally, I, I, I have quickly got tired of how much has re- has been released. These are not small releases. These single farm origins, like, if you look on on the, on the Tawar quotes, one of these is like eighty one hundred bottles, and one of them is eighty six hundred bottles. That's right. Yeah. They are not small releases. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I mean, from my point of view, like the base spirit that has went into this is very good. Mm-hmm. And I can imagine these in seven, eight, nine years being like absolutely superb. I do question the rationale. I mean, I'm not a businessman and it shows because I am obviously going to get this very wrong because this stuff has been selling like hotcakes. Yeah. So fair play. But I was slightly disappointed whenever they put stuff out younger than what they said they were going to. Um, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with like putting out a three year old. You know, yeah. like personally, I mean, I've, I've read some of the reviews on Malt from Mark and from uh, Adam. And to me, I mean, they seem to be just going like, they just seem to have a sausage fest for English whiskey at the minute, like whether it's Bimber or like Cotswolds or whatever, and they're firing out eights for like three and a half year old whiskey. Um, I'll reserve judgment on that because I haven't tried them yet, and, and I hope they are that good. And I was, I was hoping that these would be that good. Yeah. They're not eights. No. By a long shot, they are not eights. You know. I'm not going to tell you the scores that I've given them. <laughs> um, that's for that's that's for 2021. Um, but future wise, I think what's going to come out of Waterford, like it, the the potential is unbelievable. I certainly think like that Ballycockham. I mean, if that was the first ball they put out, I would I would have been sucked in. Put it like that. I I would have said, look, I, because I do, I must admit, I do really like it. Well, I have to say if, that um, you are definitely you're going against the the form at the minute here because uh, there's not a lot of people like Billy Kilcaff in that. I must, I do. Uh, as well, actually, as compared to that Van Wyden, I prefer. I, 100 percent prefer the the the, the Billy Kilcaff. It's just to me, yeah, it's it's cool. it's what I like. Yeah. Okay. It's you know it's. It's creamy, it's buttery. It is creamy and buttery, and it's and it is it's mouth watering and that sort of thing. And that's right, and because I, my, one of my favourites. Whenever when when asked the question, what is, the way you like your whiskey, I like lightly peated, uh, matured in sherry. 
Yeah. And that's what I like. And that is the more that this is sitting here, that's mm. what it's starting to feel like. It's not lightly painted. There's no peat no. there at all. No. But it's just the fact that it's we and now it's actually going. I've added that bit of water. There's very little left in the glass, and I'm actually getting a a, a dry cracker nose off it. Even you know it, it's. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> there's a certain farmyard vibrancy off this as well, mm. where it maybe does. Like I mean, if you're into things like your colcarens or your spring banks, you know, has a wee bit of that kind of dirty. It does. You know, that, I mean, this, the, this maybe isn't pushing it to the envelope that Kilcarran and so on would in that respect. No. But I mean, it, I mean, it's oily, it's creamy, it's buttery, mm -hmm. has that farmyard thing going on. So, you know, if that floats your boat, brilliant. It just, both of them, the more and more I keep going back to them, are showing their age. The more and more I sit and sip at them here. And as you said, it just, you can imagine where this is going. Mm time yeah it's just it just is the, the only thing the only thing i worry about and this goes for anybody that's releasing whiskey in ireland at the minute so i mean i i ended up getting these bottles off tinder and whiskey um because it took so back and long for them to like get released in the north yep. and eventually then the fairlies managed to get them so that was great but with postage and all the rest of these bottles basically cost me 80 quid each mm -hmm. um now down south taxes and duties are mental and the, mm -hmm. and the prices of some of the stuff that's coming out um like i mean to be honest the fact that tealing could put out a three and a half year old at 55 euros actually amazed me <laughs> to be quite honest but i do just wonder how long Will people be interested? Mm -hmm. Whenever you're releasing so many single farm origins, like the only cuvee that they have released so far is the pilgrimage, which was younger again and was 150 pound a bottle, um, and was basically made up of all the all the distillates out of mm -hmm. the blood tubs that they have, um. I just wonder how long people are going to put up with like do i spend 80 quid on a waterford to see how bally kilcavan has progressed from version 1.1 to 1.3 or do i go and spend that 80 quid and buy i don't know a bottle of jameson black bar on a bottle of Glen uh, uh, exa exactly <laughs> and, and yeah like it's, it's gonna happen because nobody's gonna want well you know the, the those same people will just keep gathering up, gathering them up, and buying them for the for the purpose of selling on later. But uh, I I agree with you there that I think people, you know, and Luna mm -hmm. Arn actually said something here that it's calmed down very quickly and it'll calm down even quicker, as yeah. in all all of that fuss will die off eventually. Yeah, and and it'll just become Waterford Distillery again because they've, yeah. and and they've sort of made a bit of a rod for their back there with. Well, I think the thing is that with any of these, like, now we're up to how many distilleries operational in Ireland? Is it 30? 35, 36. 35, 36. Yeah. Everyone's going to be interested in the first releases. Mm -hmm. And primarily that's not going to be people who are interested in actually drinking this stuff. It's going to be people who are going to go, well, I have the first release and then I can put it in SWA or whoever it is, right? Yeah. Um, like for instance, on Saturday night, I opened a bottle of the Pilgrimage, which is going in auction for between 900 euros and 1200 euros a bottle, mm -hmm. right? I don't know anybody else that's opened a bottle. <laughs> I know it's nonsense. It's it's just, nonsense like. I don't know anybody else that has a bottle open. Yeah. Um, well, kudos to you, Phil. Yeah, I don't um, tell people what you did with it, but good on you. <laughs> <laughs> I well, you know, toilet cleaners. No, 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 no. Uh, but <laughs> but that, no, you're 100 percent right. You know, and it, it, it's it's. I just think that it's getting a bit. It, the same happened with these Dunvals releases. Now, as you said earlier, uh, there's there's effort put in, the times put in, you know, and all that there. But it, it's just 
and fairness to them yet again it's the limited release it, it's the limit that, that Dunville's do put in those bottlings yeah but nobody's buying them to open them and drink them you know well, the thing about it is Jim right I initially had a problem with some of the pricing that Ashlandville were doing with Dunville's right I was sitting going to myself whenever the first now I have an issue with the 12 year old PX mm -hmm. right it's just far too expensive at 88 pounds. Yeah. At 88 pounds, I'm buying Glendronic 18, mm -hmm. right? Or something similar. But then they brought out the 12 year old PX cast strength, and it was 110 quid for the first bottle. And some people are going, oh, that's a bit pricey. Well, the Whiskey Barrel have just released like a 10 year old Coila, fully matured in sherry casks at 120 quid a bottle. And Coila is like a massive output. But you're talking like yeah. five, six million liters a year. That's, that's yep. not rare. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And I've, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing more and more, even with Scotch, that you're looking at, you know, 10, 12, 15 year old castrons that are at least 100 to maybe 150 quid. So it's not just an Irish problem now. The problem is that we're paying it. <laughs> um, and the thing is, too, I think the more of us, this is maybe a very personal thing, actually, but uh, and and it's people like yourself and and I'm going to go back to Greg again. The event reduced me to whiskies, older whiskies, subtler whiskies, whiskies that, as we all know, or most of us know, that whenever you had age, you generally bring your 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 ABV down because they're just they're leveling yeah. out at a, you know, and and even what I started on there tonight, uh, Tullamore Dew 14. You know, yeah. bald at forty was a forty one point five percent or something like that there, yeah. and uh, it's and it, it's whenever you go down. I think the more we're learning, the more we're we we ask in one hand for ABV, and we ask in the other hand for flavor and nuance and <clears throat> nuance. Yeah, and I find an awful lot of times that the two of those can't go together because. When you, especially whenever you get up to those cast strengths, yes, I know people are saying, I would just thin them down to the point when you, you get to that. But, but no, that it doesn't work that way. It just, it, you know, when you get something, as I say, take that Tullamore Jew, for instance, and Greg shared with me some older bush mills and stuff. And it's when you bring the ABV down or when, when they're at that age or whatever, you got to go looking for those that nuance and got to go looking for it, but it's there and it's there in spades and it's yeah. it's it's quality that comes with it and whatnot and and it's just we do ask for ABV. We we'll look at those cast strengths and go, well, oh, these are this is great. The distilleries are then putting the arm in every time and going here. This is yeah. what people want, so we'll just well, keep pushing the price up. It's interesting. I bought um, a bottle of Amnok, sixteen year old, mm -hmm. which kind of proves your point. Because it's a kind of subtle, challenging whiskey, right? It's something that you have to sit with for, and you have to concentrate on. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're starting to pull stuff like, out of your head and all the rest of it. And I think sometimes now we have got so used to like massive sherry bombs, or, I mean, it's one of the reasons why JJ prefers a bourbon cask. Mm -hmm. Because and sometimes as you go older, whether it's like a, maybe into the late teens and stuff, you maybe actually a second fill bourbon cask is good because you get a nice counterbalance between the spirit and the cask yeah. and what goes on there. And neither is dominating each other, but there's this mm -hmm. lovely, you know, counterpoint. Um, whereas sometimes a lot of these whiskeys are just so like in your face, you know, sherry or like the wine casks as well can be brutal, yep. <laughs> you know, where, I mean, uh, on, on the malt, we done one about the Dingston 2008 Bordeaux cask, um, both myself and JJ were both pretty much agreed that it was like, you know, where's the fruity Dingston spirit? Yeah. All we've got here is a load of Bordeaux. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes that's fine. Sometimes that's what you're in the mood for. Exactly, you know. Exactly, and I mean, because funny, I, I bought a, a, I managed to get my hands on a Ben Romick cast strength batch one yeah. there, yeah. Uh, just last week, and it's just this powerhouse. 
that you just, you know, it's a case of what, where, what, what can I do with this? Really, you know, it, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll thin it, I'll thin it, and I'm, I'm still thinning it, you know, and it, okay, right, I found, you know, there's a bit of a balance there, but I better check what I thinned it to because I'd need to do it again the next time, you know, yeah. and it, it just, as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? You know, because yes, yes. we do want, I mean. I can't imagine that these Waterfords. I think that they're 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 playing the game right there as such. We're going right. That's bottle these at a high percentage hmm. without blowing the face off you. Without you know, let's keep the the the. I think the, the interesting thing here is that I mean these don't drink like fifty percent. No, they don't. And, which actually, and which to me, although I may not be massively enamored with the finished product i think it shows how good the quality of spirit is because it's not fire water i mean mm -hmm. that is a very drinkable whiskey it, well what actually has done is at 50 percent has given you the opportunity because i actually went back into that uh the banner island and added more water yeah. while we were speaking and it's to me, it's a much more palatable whiskey now, just by bringing it down a bit again. It's just and and it's and that's the thing. To me, if you get a drinkable whiskey at fifty percent, but there's still margin to bring it down. That's whereas to me, as I say, if it's okay, there's a lot of those higher ones. I was talking earlier on about that tealing single cask. Yeah, and I actually have a sample set aside for you because. Uh, I know you don't really take samples at the minute, but I don't care. There'll be some coming to you anyway. Uh, and it's just, it just doesn't work for me. It's just right. it's bald at 64.1% or something like that. And it's just... But you, then you're, you're kind of ask, asking the question, what did it come off the stills at? Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, and, and it just it doesn't... I just don't know where to go with it. It's just too aggressive. Too aggressive. And it was, and it wasn't cheap, you know. No. And and you're just so what you're paying for, because as I said to you at the time, I, I think you and I were talking about this. And the reason I bought it was I wanted to try teeling whiskey. Yes. Yeah. And and the reason and that was why I, I knew I was getting teeling whiskey. But I've still no idea what teeling whiskey tastes like. I can tell you what <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what paraffin tastes like. <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of in a similar boat. I mean, I've, I've actually just ordered tonight the, the uh, their new release, the Black Pits, which is their peated single malt. Mm -hmm. Now, I was not impressed with their pot still. Uh, I thought it was awful. Um, now, it's interesting to see the progression. I think the first one was so confused because they used something like six different casks, which was a mistake. I think, again... Yeah. If they just went down the simple route of like, oh, we put it in first full bourbon. Yeah. There you go. And you can see what kind of the spirit is with a bit of wood influence, you know. But whenever you're adding in like white and red wine casks and cognac and goodness knows what else, it's just confused. It's a confused mess, you know. I think, um, yeah, you and I, well, you and I have our, our place. Sorry to disturb you there. But uh, I, I, I'm starting to just firmly believe that the only reason why we are up until now, we really only had pot still from Middleton is because Middleton know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, at the end of the day, they, they've been the custodians of it. They know what they're at. You know? Uh, Actually, I just want to pick out a comment that Luna made, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, go ahead. That, how long do you think all these prices will keep on climbing and who is willing to pay these prices? That's a question I've been asking for a long time, Luna. Um, <clears throat> at some point, especially with the situation that we find ourselves in now, um, sadly, it seems as though people are going to be losing jobs. And down the line, I don't know what way governments are going to intervene, whatever. People are going to have less disposable income, quite simply. They're not going to take risks. You know, at the end of the day, at the minute, we are very fortunate in that we are able to purchase luxury items because let's not forget, this is, you know, 
this stuff is a luxury item. It's not something that you're putting in. It's not a bread basket item. Do you know what I mean? Um, so to a certain extent, I fear for some of the new distilleries because if they don't play their cards right, they're going to go bust before they even start. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the options I have, do I go and buy another bottle of water for Billy Kilcavan? Or do I go and buy a bottle of Red Breast 12-year-old cast for the same price? I know what I'd do. <laughs> well, I know what I would do as well. <laughs> do you know? Um, and that's only Ireland. That's not even looking... Hey, do you know what? To go and buy a bottle of Four Roses single barrel mm -hmm. for like 40 quid. Do you, know, do, do you go and look at something like a, a, a bottle from, from Holland? Um, oh, what do you call them? Millstone. Go and buy a bottle of Millstone for maybe like 45 to 60 euros, whatever. And some of their young whiskey, like the Rise, are fantastic, like really flavorful interesting whiskies you know it, it um it's basically i always think about these things and think of the of the the act pop will eat itself i don't know if you remember, remember yeah yeah remember it's going harder, really. <laughs> yeah and uh um, and it's a case of you know whiskey will eat itself because uh these are the, the problem is that with as you said, these these are, are items. These are luxury items, and the luxury items that people have bought to sell on later are worth nothing now either. No, because he's going to buy them. Exactly. If if we can't afford to buy them off the shelf, we certainly can't afford to buy them from an auction. So, you know, everybody's out. Yeah. And uh, and the, yet again, I think this is what I love about this. Uh, this community that we're all we've all got enough smarts about us we're all savvy enough to i know there's flippers out there and there's people i i've i sold a bottle of whiskey last week i don't mind it's not you know i, I bought yeah. it for the purposes of selling because yeah. i knew it was going to sell for twice the price i didn't pay an awful lot for it in the first place so to double its money sure but and that it, and that and that allows you to reinvest in something you want to review. Well, what did I buy? More whiskey. Ah. You know, <laughs> and uh, so it's it's that's what it's about, and it, it just is. It's sad. I mean, people keep talking about the bubble or about the bubble bursting. I imagine it will. I just it don't know to. when. I mean, it has to. Um, mm -hmm. These things always happen. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at some of the prices now. Uh, Des has said, do I hear whiskey lock? Absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, Roy has I mean, Roy has touched on this about not even just a physical whiskey lock with producers, but mm -hmm. the whiskey lock that exists within our own collections. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are people that have... I mean, I, I'm sitting in here at the minute with like 250 bottles, which is totally unhealthy for one person to even consider. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and the thing is, I'm still buying more, right? I know. Which, but, you know, it's mental. Um, so for every, I just think for every bottle you buy, you just... Uh, I said I would have one earlier. Sorry to disturb you, to interrupt you again. Uh, drums and Draws, Tony. You yeah. know Tony. Oh, no, Tony, so, yeah. Tony, Tony landed at my door the other week. Uh, right. To say completely out of the blue, he, he asked me my address. I thought he was going to post me some. And then there was this knock on the door. <laughs> now, I wasn't complaining because he brought me some uh, fabulous samples. But right. Tony and I were talking about, about that. I actually completely lost my train of thought there when everyone in the talk. What were we talking about? He looks. Yes. But there was something else. <laughs> I can't remember what it was, <laughs> but it was something to do with buying whiskey. Anyway, oh, I it was a bit, a bit, yes. And well, I'll say Tony said it, but we all say it that you go look. I, I, I'm focusing on that ball. Buy that ball, yeah, and then that'll do for a while or whatever. Or, or I'm, I'm focused and I'm going to wait and then buy that ball. 
But yeah. by the time you, you wait to buy that ball, you've bought three other balls and added them to a collect, you know. And I've said a few times recently that the wisest thing I did recently was to stop making lists of what I had. I used to keep a list of what I had just to yeah. kind of stop yeah. that. I completely forgot about it. And it was the wisest thing I've ever done because then I started killing bottles. Yeah. I, I stopped hogging, dra- you know, literally the other yeah. end of bottles and just drinking them yeah. and enjoying them. Absolutely. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you know, and this is where I think we differ from, we're, we're collectors of sorts in that, you know, you're wanting to experience as many different whiskies as you can, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's basically my whole thing. I, mean, I, I don't really align myself to any particular bl- brand. I just want yeah. to go on and try what I'm interested in trying or what I have the money available to go and buy that particular month or whatever. Um, and it's just, I, I'm just constantly looking to broaden my palette to broaden my horizons. Um, I don't get hung up and buying multiple bottles of anything. Like, I mean, uh, literally, I think I have four four bottles in there that I have multiples of. Mm-hmm. One of them is a dark silky, and that's only because Dave Maher ordered me to. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, so and I'm pretty much through the first one, and I'm, I'll be I'll be done soon because I'll be bottling some of that for samples. Um, I had a couple of Red Breast single casks. I'm down to one of those now. I bought a couple of uh, Glenlivet 16-year-old Najuras. I'm down to the last bottle of that now. Um, but, like, that's it. Like, uh, I don't get... some. Sometimes, I think, as well, there's a beauty in the fact that you've only had one bottle of something. Yeah. Do you know, like... I mean, one of the bottles that opened recently... And you probably seen it on Instagram was uh, the bottle of Cadenhead's ten year old Highland Park that's m- matured and mm-hmm. sherry cask, right? I never thought I was going to get another bottle of that. And thanks to my good friend Andrew Watson, he bought a couple of bottles and he passed one on at cost price because he was like, "I know you love that one so much." Mm-hmm. Right? The only condition is give me a sample because yeah. it's beyond. He collects. He, he properly collects. Mm-hmm. So. Like the 80 quid that he spent was that's beyond his drinking budget. So mm-hmm. let me try it. Yeah. Man, easy, not a problem. For me, that's easy. <laughs> do you know? Um, do you know? I mean, at the end of the day, man, the way I look at it is we spend money on this stuff. I want to know what it tastes like. Well, that's what I was about to say. I, I couldn't buy it and not open it to know what it tastes like. You know, to, yeah. to sit and look at it and go, all right, okay, it'd be nice to have the money to buy two, three balls. But I don't know. It, yet again, as you said, to have a bottle of it, and that is an experience to drink yeah. one bottle of it because it lasts that long. And yeah. if you find yourself going, nope, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to taste it, and I'm going to make sure I get the best out of that. Or Absolutely. you buy a bottle, you buy a bottle of Hinch, single pot <laughs> still. <laughs> <laughs> I, pour, I just pour the bugger down the sink. But listen, here, I, as I said to you earlier, I've got a, a half five start in the morning, yes, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, as much as I would love to uh, continue this conversation all night, because, and the thing is, uh, the people that are in the chat, uh, I know that. That the, they're enjoying it as well. I just do, and uh, and I'm certainly enjoy. I always enjoy a chat with you. Actually, yet again, this is the thing. It sort of puts me off what's going on at the minute because you and I sat down, actually sat down with a coffee together at the start of summer, yeah. and right. and you know, there's nothing like that, especially whenever you're when you're like minded people. I don't think yeah. we get the opportunity often enough to sit face to face. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, and yet again, as I said earlier, about Tony rocking up at the door. <laughs> and I, I we just ended up sitting there for and, and, and he never even he never even turned his car off. His car was running the whole time. And I think we were talking for like 45, 50 minutes, and his car was just sitting off. No. He just had a conversation about whiskey and you forget about the world. Like Yeah, and Tony's responsible now for the uh Antarctic uh <laughs> 
<laughs> Antarctic ice melting because he left his yeah. car running. Yeah. <laughs> That's his fault. <laughs> but no, as I say, Phil, I really I do appreciate you coming on as always. Yeah, I appreciate you, you. I appreciate you having uh, having us on. Um, it was great to have a wee chat about Waterford. See what's happening. Uh, uh, Thank Man, you very much. Uh, as, you know, as well, you know. As you know, I was uh, I was mad keen to try the Waterford. I, I had yeah. told you, and uh, I think I even told you before you you had managed to get your hands on those bottles, and it was just. I must say it was incredibly interesting for me. You were you were giving us information the other night that I wasn't aware of. And even stuff about Waterford themselves and stuff from elsewhere. <laughs> that one about Bruce Mills is a gem. And <laughs> yeah. uh, and just just for you know oh, just thanks for being on, mate. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I appreciate the crack and uh you know keep keep up the good work as well, Jim. Um well. Uh, I like the fact as well that you you stick to your own guns. You're not, uh, you know, you, sometimes you should maybe consider doing a wee article for Malt. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I can't read or write. <laughs> <laughs> well, stick to the well, <laughs> well, I mean, I do. I like to. This is the thing that that was part of the reason why I actually started originally. I I was thinking of just blogging. I was thinking of just you know and. It was one of those things that I thought if I if I talk that much for that long, you would never stop me if I started writing it down. It would just, you know, and I actually do. It's one of those things that uh, oh, Alan McLaughlin's just in. It's one of those things that. Uh, good evening, Alan. I even just writing for because there's not enough room sometimes, as we as we all know on on uh, uh, social media. To, yeah. to say what you want to say yep. and i actually get the opportunity through the patrons sometimes to, to fill it out a bit and i do enjoy it i do you know i do enjoy throwing a few words together but yeah. it's so much easier just to to interact just, like this it is uh, it is it you is know. Uh, especially like uh one of the things like doing the interview pieces they're a nightmare like uh a, you know uh, a 25 minute conversation takes about four days to type out you know yeah um, <laughs> just a nightmare but here it's, you know that's the world working people you know what that makes uh, for this is part of what i i've i know i've moaned about it an awful lot recently about having to go back to work but the biggest annoyance for me was this that i it, it robbed me of this yeah yeah you know I, I i'm not i was able just to come and go as i pleased with with videos and 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 try and stick to a rota and stick to because I, I've this anal thing about being, you know, keep things, <laughs> yeah, I just can't help myself. And, uh, and you know, every Thursday night I would have been in for the V pub with Roy yeah, and yeah. all that there. And, and all of a sudden, then that was just cut off. If you want yeah. to earn money, Ingram, get back to work. <laughs> I forget, I forget <laughs> about that lot. And it's just like, it's like, no, I can't, you know, I, I, that's the bit that annoys me. Well, here, JJ has just given us a 7 out of 10, so we've done something all right tonight. Nice uh, one. Well, happy days. That, that is a proper malt review. <laughs> and a, good, a good point to cut this now. <laughs> right. uh, Phil, hang around. I'll I'll, uh, I'll say my good nights to you in a moment. And oh, thank you, you very much for joining us tonight. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's me for, as I say, there'll be another, another one this October. Uh, in about three weeks' time, and I will have another guest who was in tonight. I hope I'll have another guest who was in tonight. I think him and I have arranged something. I think. Uh, but uh, I, I'll certainly be in touch with him, figure things out. And uh, listen, once again, thank you all for being here. I really, really do enjoy this time. And as I said, it's just unfortunate that, it, that I just don't get as much of it as I used to. But hopefully, at some point, those days will return. Listen, I don't even look. Here, we'll do. Oh, 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 that was a good pop. This was uh, what I started the night with to warm up my palate. I'm just going to put a little drop in my glass because I'm going to have to go to bed. Just in case anybody was wondering, Tullamore Dew, 14 year old. Uh, yes. Gone out of focus right at the very end. Ah, does it matter? Here's to your good health, folks. Good night and cheers. Mm -hmm.